I'm the cartoonist uh, for City Pages. If you open to page three uh, every week, you'll see that signature up until next week. Uh, we just had a falling out with my editor after 10 years of dedicated service. And uh, so unless we get a storm of protest from angry readers. What was that address again? <laughs> Which, of course, if you address them to Steve Perry, the editor, he will quietly throw them away and not tell anyone that he got them. But if you address them to the publisher or you send them to my magazine, Mini Haha, -ha, we can uh, make a case. This is a magazine I publish uh, six times a year. This is a uh, humor and satire. It's uh, this the current issue with uh, the new Elvis Presley postage stamp art. <coughs> Our choice, <laughs> the older portrait. I don't know if I have enough for everyone. I just uh, let you pass them down. A few more. And uh, <clears throat> only, please don't start flipping through them right now because I, I shouldn't have done that. Right? I shouldn't have handed them. <laughs> Big mistake. Well, okay. Uh, I am a political cartoonist. I think there is some difference between a political cartoonist and an editorial cartoonist. A political cartoonist, uh, when I do political cartoons, I try to incorporate uh, several different dimensions. I think that a good political cartoonist should always be uh, all of these things. An artist first, a political scientist, a humorist or an entertainer, a uh, political activist, and a journalist. And I really don't think if you fail to do any one of those things that you really qualify as a good political cartoonist. Um, what when I approach uh, doing a political cartoon, uh, I'm an artist first. The thing that matters most to me is having an impact on the people who see the cartoon, is, ha is ha having some kind of a rapport or relationship with the readers and uh, that make them not just be a reader but a participant in it. And I think that's what good art does. I'm, I'm very much an expressionist cartoonist. Uh, I think uh, expressions are the basis of a good cartoon, any kind of cartoon, whether it's uh, a gag cartoon, which is uh, totally different from a political or editorial cartoon. That's the kind of thing that uh, Gary Larson does, uh, The Far Side. Mm -hmm. uh, I consider a single panel to be a cartoon, or at least usually a single panel. And by a panel, it might be, a, it might be round, it might be the family circus or whatever. Uh, when it's a, a multiple panel, it's usually a comic strip. The difference between the two basically is that a single panel or a cartoon tells a joke. A multiple panel or a comic strip tells a little story, a funny story, which may or may not have an actual punchline at the end. Joke always has a punchline. So that's uh, my basic definition. Now that isn't really an agreed upon definition. It's kind of implicit, but I've never heard any other cartoonist or uh, you know, uh, art teacher or whatever talk about that. So that's, that's something I'm suggesting is probably a safe uh, definition and hasn't really been uh, established that widely yet. But uh, uh, a gag cartoon is a cartoon that basically sets out to entertain people to make them laugh. An editorial or political cartoon is a cartoon that has a message. It makes a statement of opinion. The, the key word here is opinion. The best political cartoons do not just state the obvious or a very simplistic opinion. You know, they don't just say, uh, Re, they don't just reiterate the headlines. And, and there are lots and lots and lots of cartoonists these days who call themselves political cartoonists, 
who really would be more accurately defined as gag cartoonists who happen to be folk using political topics to make a joke. They're not really taking a stand. They're not really uh, going beneath the surface and, and uh, bringing out some new ideas, some new thoughts, some new, uh, you know, some new uh, explorations of uh, topics that are happening. They're just kind of taking the most obvious thing that, that you see. And uh, for example, I'm trying to think, Steve Sack, uh, the Star and Tribune, and Macintosh, who occasionally does an editorial, a so-called editorial cartoon for the Star and Tribune, uh, are both tend to be more of a more gag cartoonist. Although Steve Sack occasionally does some good political cartoons, or some very mild political cartoons, but a, a really good political cartoonist uh, should should have some bite. And uh, so that's the art artist, the, the scientist, the humorist, uh, political activist. The very first, the earliest uh, political cartoons were blatant propaganda. Uh, I have a slide of this, I could just draw it. Uh, you've probably seen that uh, from the American Revolution, the uh, snake divided into 13 sections. I think it was 13 at that time, each labeled after one of the colonies, New Hampshire, uh, whatever, Connecticut, Delaware, you know, New York. <laughs> and uh, the caption was, join or die. This was uh, one of the first uh, true political cartoons published in an American newspaper, in a colonial newspaper. Anybody know who drew it, who wrote it and drew it? Ben Franklin. Right, Ben Franklin, who also said we must all hang together, or most assuredly, we will all hang separately, right? So that was his visual way of putting it. Now, uh, you know, throughout the first half of our history or more, uh, illiteracy was uh, rampant in America. So political cartoons had a very important place in having an effect on what was happening politically. So, uh, No, actually, these days, uh, that's something I'll talk about a little later, is uh, what it's like to do political cartoons now and how that relates to literacy. Uh, there's two kinds of literacy. You know, there's the kind of literacy that we're all familiar with, uh, you know, verbal literacy or, or uh, the ability to read words. But uh, something most people don't think about is visual literacy. And that's why I'm here today. I'm trying to... Uh, provoke you to uh, do what you can to increase your visual literacy and your, your awareness and your appreciation of the uh, medium of cartooning. Uh, cartoons, most of the cartoons that are published in this country are horrible. They're really bad. And uh, they're getting worse all the time. Well, I shouldn't say that. Actually, there are a few really good cartoonists uh, who do fantastic drawings and have very little, if anything, to say. <laughs> So uh, you kind of have the two extremes. You have the, the, they call them the wrists, you know, people who can draw like a machine. And you have the, uh, the, the Matt Groening's, you know, the guy who does The Simpsons, you know, uh, who can't draw at all, but they have some funny ideas for characters or whatever. Uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, with regard to the history of American cartooning, uh, the, most, the, the person who's considered the father of American political cartoons was Thomas Nast. You probably read about him, right? And Thomas Nast was, of course, the uh, cartoonist for uh, Harper's Weekly in uh, the 1860s in uh, New York. And Nast was uh, known for doing you know, particularly biting political cartoons, very intricately drawn, savage caricatures. And caricature, I'm going to talk about that in a bit, is a uh, to me is a crucial component to doing a great, a great political cartoon. Thomas Nast, uh, one of his most famous caricatures of uh, Boss Tweed, he was a big fat guy who always wore this, this pennant, this brooch. That was his, kind of his trademark.
did a uh, caricature of uh, Boss Tweed, the, the mayor of New York City, this notorious uh, leader of a corrupt administration in uh, the city of New York. And uh, he did this caricature, which showed Boss Tweed as a, having a money bag for a head. which she, you know, put that in terms of, that'd be like billions now. It's just an incredible amount of money. And just soaking the taxpayers, just uh, bleeding them dry. He would uh, do things like order a set of four chairs from a, a merchant and then have an agreement, you know, I'll pay you $10,000 for these four wooden chairs. I'll kick back 1000 bucks to you. And uh, he was just brutal. He was ruthless. Uh, one of the cartoons that uh, Nass drew of him showed Boss Tweed uh, simply saying, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I did it, but as long as I count the votes, uh, what, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so they were, it was kind of a Noriega, uh, Marcos, you know, type of uh, voting system. And uh, uh, as time went on, uh, Thomas Nast was the fellow who developed some of the symbols, and symbols are another important component to good political, effective political cartooning. Uh, you know, monetary symbols, religious symbols, and lots of political symbols. Now we have uh, ecological symbols. Uh, this is a more recent one in history. Uh, but Thomas Nast came up with the use of, for example, the Democratic donkey and the Republican elephant. Uh, it was Nast who popularized the use of these animals to symbolize these parties. And uh, he also used quite a few others. You know, he had an eagle representing something. He had one really famous, uh, he did a lot of anti-Catholic cartoons. He just hated the Catholic Church because they were so power hungry. And uh, he did uh, the, the bishop, or whatever, whatever that rank is where they wear the the hat like that, you know? And he had them, he made them into crocodiles. <laughs> Did he do uh, St. Nicholas or a popular right. vision of uh, Santa Claus? Right, Thomas Nast did the, uh, the, the uh, image of Santa Claus that really was the precursor to the modern Santa Claus with the big beard. And you've seen it a million times. You've seen this intricately cross-hatched drawing of Santa Claus with a big long stem pipe, and it's it's really old. You know, I mean, well, it's <laughs> over 100 years old, and uh, has all the cross hatching. Which, when I say cross hatching, I'm referring to using a, you know, this uh, this technique for shading. So he uh, he did a lot, and the interesting thing, uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, testimonials to the effectiveness of the political cartoon in America was that when Thomas Nast kept attacking and attacking and attacking and attacking Boss Tweed through his political cartoons during this time when most people couldn't read, uh, uh, Tweed was quoted to have said to his henchmen, stop them damn pictures. My constituents can't read, but damn it, they look at the pictures. It was really getting under his skin because T Nast was starting to have an effect. Eventually, uh, partly due to Nast's persistence, uh, Tweed was more, more uh, was investigated more. Thanks to uh, Nast's cartoons, Tweed was investigated and basically run out of office and fled the country before he was able to be prosecuted. Before they were able to catch up with him, he fled to Europe. And uh, he got away for a while. A few years later, uh, someone in Paris who had seen the caricatures that Nast had done of Tweed, saw Tweed and identified him from the caricature. And they caught up with him and he spent the rest of his life in jail. So uh, there has been a role for political cartoons in the history of this country as, as you know, having an impact on changing things. And that would be the political activist uh, aspect that I was talking about. He was also a fairly strong supporter of Abraham Lincoln, I think, during the Civil War terms of stretching his character and making yeah, him larger I can't than white. Really, yeah, I think he was. I, I'm trying to remember. I, I, actually, I actually own a number of, uh, not the originals, but the uh, original sheets from the Harper's 
magazine than our frame. But uh, uh, that's just a basic kind of historical. What happened after that, we had, uh, just made some notes, uh, through the uh, early 1900s from uh, the very end of the uh, 19th century through about 1950s, uh, political cartoons, there really were no political cartoons anymore except with the exception of a very few cartoonists like Herblock and uh, maybe uh, Homer Davenport, uh, Ding, Darling. Uh, cartoonists uh, generally throughout that period did very vapid, boring, pictorial depictions of, uh, you know, simplistic uh, political points of view that just kind of reinforced the editorials <coughs> in their newspapers. And they had very little pizzazz. They didn't have any real humor. Um, you know, there was a thing with the big boot coming down on the masses or the Mr. Globe, you know, uh, like half the cartoons <laughs> they did were the guy with the globe head, you know. I mean, uh, they used Uncle Sam and they used uh, the Statue of Liberty and all those symbols, but they didn't really say anything with them. Well, the late 50s, along came the new wave in political cartooning. And this was not, uh, uh, you know, they weren't wearing uh, uh, safety pins through their noses or anything. Uh, this was a group of young cartoonists, of whom, one of whom was uh, my mentor, Bill Sanders of the Milwaukee Journal. I grew up in Milwaukee. And uh, the new wave of political cartooning that came along in the 50s uh, uh, argued that it was time to make political cartoons more effective again, to make them have more of a bite, and to use them to really stir things up a little bit, to create some controversy, to uh, generate discussion about issues, and uh, not to just do these inane little stupid pictures that were just kind of breaking up copy in the, in the newspapers. Uh, they caused a lot of waves with this uh, uh, you know, assertion and with the criticisms of the older cartoonists, who of course didn't like it. And, uh, but they did have a, a great effect on uh, political cartooning. I'm going to show you a few of their slides here. Um, and uh, they did some really hard hitting, this is where the term sledgehammer cartoon came from, the late 50s, the new wave. This is where the sledgehammer cartoon came from, the real sock them between the eyes kind of approach to uh, you know, nailing a politician who was guilty of some uh, uh, hypocrisy or abuse of power or a crime. As we got into the 60s, cartoons be actually started becoming downright funny. It's the first time in uh, the history of cartooning that, that we had a real pie in the face kind of uh, uh, yuck, 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 you know, but still a political cartoon. And this was initiated mostly by Oliphant, Pat Oliphant, who's carried in the Star and Trib here. Uh, Pat Oliphant uh, started out in Australia. He's an Australian, uh, and he had a strong influence from the English political cartoonists and caricature artists, Ronald Searle. Uh, if you ever get a chance to look him up in the library, if you can find a book by Ronald Searle, S-E-A-R-L-E. -E. Um, he's an English caricaturist and cartoonist who does the most... Uh, fantastic, uh, you know, just, just, a, just a naturally funny style of drawing and uh, great caricatures, and he has a few books out. He's in The Guardian, isn't he? Manchester yeah, Guardian. probably, yeah. In England, you know, there's a great tradition of caricature in England that we Americans really do not share. Uh, it's funny that caricatures are very popular, I find, among the public in general, but when you go to editors, newspaper editors, magazine editors, there's very few who really appreciate the value of a good caricature and who really have a grasp of how much readers like caricatures. That's their visual illiteracy. You've, maybe you've uh, seen or heard about uh, you know, these <coughs> studies. Well, st studies on left and right brain differentiation and how the right hemisphere tends to specialize in visual uh, sorts of uh, activities and information processing. The left hemisphere tends to specialize in verbal or digital or logical or sequential types of information processing. And uh, you can really sort of use it as a guide to reading personalities. <laughs> 
because uh, editors who are very left brain generally, who are very much word specialists, have pretty much shunted off in general their right brain. They're they're kind of they're very visually illiterate because all their focus is on reading, 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 writing, 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 reading, reading. They spend very little time looking around and looking at you know looking at art, for example, or not comparatively a little time to the rest of us. And uh, if you go to the other extreme, you find an artist who does a lot of painting, a lot of uh, you know looking around and sketching and uh, looking at other people's art. They tend to be more right brain, and they tend to be worse at uh, verbal skills. There's a lot of classic examples of that. You know, Andy Warhol. You know, uh, once he was so famous, he he uh, at one time there was a demand for him to go do a speaking tour. And he was notorious. He was great at, on the phone. He could chat all day, you know, talk his head off. But when it came to like speaking or making a statement, he would say, well, uh, why don't you just tell me what to say and I'll just repeat it after you, you know. And he, every, everything was just, he'd just say, uh, great, great. You know, that's like the only word in his vocabulary most of the time. But he uh, was a great visual artist. Um, there, there have been some interesting studies with uh, uh, patients of hemispherectomies. People who had a terrible tumor in part of their brain and actually had to have half of their brain removed, or a big portion of, of uh, half of their brain. And uh, many patients who had this survived. And uh, this was a, a really good confirmation of how, uh, how much there is to this, you know, uh, 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 the right and left hemisphere do specialize in this way. For example, uh, people who had the left hemisphere removed were very frustrated. They were very upset because they could tell something was gone and they couldn't talk very well. They, they could still sing. They could still swear <laughs> because these are emotive. You know, it's kind of like Star Trek, right and left hemisphere. You know, right hemisphere is like uh, Dr. McCoy, intuitive, emotional. Uh, outgoing, and the left hemisphere is like Mr. Spock, you know, logical, sequential, uh, very uh, reserved and pulled in. And uh, uh, these people who had the hemispherectomies, the people who had the left hemisphere removed uh, could tell that something was wrong, and they were very upset, and uh, they couldn't talk, and they, they would express themselves very well physically, but not verbally. The people who had the left hemisphere removed, on the other hand, this was very interesting for those of us who are artists and find this world to be a very frustrating place most of the time because we're surrounded by people who are not very right brain. Um, the people who had the right brain removed couldn't tell that anything was wrong. <laughs> they thought everything was just fine because what the, right, what the left brain does is it is a fantastic rationalizer. It's very subjective. The right brain tends to be much more objective. It looks at the world as uh, just this kind of panoply of objects. And uh, so when you're dealing with an editor and you're trying to explain to them why this is funny or why <laughs> this is, looks good, forget it. You don't have a chance. You don't stand a chance unless you happen to have an editor who happens to be a little more well-rounded. This is very rare. I've been at City Pages for 10 years up till today, <laughs> and this is the reason why I'm not there today. I kind of reached the end of my rope with a very left-brained editor. Um, but I did have one editor, Craig Cox, who was there for three and a half years, who was a dream come true, and he was very balanced, great sense of humor, uh, and more visual, you know. So, uh, uh, there are editors out there, but uh, generally the, the tendency is uh, that uh, cartoonists have a very hard time uh, answering to editors. And you'll hear this, every cartoonist you talk to, you hear the same thing, you know, uh, about the limitations on their, on their freedom to uh, do their job. Because really, uh, it's an area of expertise that... Uh, if you devote your life like I have to reading cartoons, drawing cartoons, studying about cartoons, writing about cartoons, speaking about cartoons, 
you know, naturally you're going to develop more expertise on the subject than somebody who sits behind a desk and, and uh, kind of lords over you and, and, and bases their opinions on their subjective, uh, their own subjective likes and dislikes, which is what most people do when it comes to humor and cartoons, which is why we have, for example, The Simpsons being such a great success. The Simpsons is not a very good cartoon, I'm sorry. It's very well written because they have a lot of good writers working on the staff. Uh, it's very well directed and produced because they have the best directors and producers in television. Uh, the stories are nice, you know, but uh, those drawings are, are awful. I mean, they're pretty expressive and that's, that's good, but uh, they really aren't, uh, you know, and I, I was saying this way back and everybody was on the, the big hype about The Simpsons. Oh, The Simpsons, The Simpsons. You know, okay, okay. Uh, and, and whenever I would criticize them, they'd, they would Im immediately assume it was like kind of professional jealousy. Hey, you know, I like a lot of cartoons. <laughs> I don't happen to think The Simpsons are very good. Um, and uh, I was kind of redeemed when Chuck Jones, the director who did the old Roadrunner cartoons, the best Roadrunner cartoons, the late 40s and 50s, uh, was on uh, the Comedy Channel being interviewed and he said, they asked him, how do you like The Simpsons? And he said, what's to like? It's not really a cartoon because it doesn't integrate the verbal and visual components. A good cartoon really does an effective job of integrating visual and verbal. It's not just a combination of visual and verbal. How many people have seen uh, Ernie Pook's comedy, Belinda Berry? City Pages? Back of City Pages? Mm -hmm. Nobody? Yeah. <laughs> or Matt Groening's Life in Hell? Yeah. Yeah. Now there are examples of people who are great writers, great writers, who were good at writing, in Groening's case it was more jokes, uh, in uh, Linda Berry's case it's more of a prose. And they illustrate, they illustrate these little writings with very simplistic images they're not usually very well drawn. Uh, these are not true cartoons. These are illustrated uh, stories or illustrated gags or whatever, but they're not true cartoons. It's not even right to call Linda Berry a cartoonist. I've never seen her do a cartoon. She's a great writer, and uh, a lot of her drawings are really neat, but it's just not a correct term to say cartoonist. More of a comic writer, I guess you'd call her. Pete, I was wondering if you could maybe just back up, you started touching on Oliphant and uh, Rod Searle and then some of the, the cartoonists that came out of the late 50s, got in the 60s. I was wondering if you maybe mention a little bit about R. Crumb and some of the underground 60s cartoonists and how that maybe became part of the communication of uh, the social protest movement in oh. the 60s and, and early 70s. Ralph Bakshi mm -hmm. might be a, another person that you throw into that same category. Uh, you occurred there. Yeah, it's kind of hard to... Uh, I was thinking of Art Crum in particular. Talk about him without showing him, you know? Yeah. And uh, actually, I'm not, you know, I, I haven't really thought about, it's like I'm intuitively familiar with those people, but I haven't, uh, I don't know that much about them as cartoonists. I know that, uh, you know, they all started with the early alternative newspapers, like when Rolling Stone still looked much cheesier than this. You know, there was a time when Rolling Stone was just a little rag mm -hmm. and uh, didn't have any color, didn't have any, probably had eight pages or something. Um, and uh, along with the new movement in alternative media, alternative newspapers in the uh, mid-60s mostly and late 60s, uh, they're spraying up a few cartoonists. I think R. Crumb was like working at a greeting card factory or something and then he got just fed up with it and moved to Haight-Ashbury and started dropping acid like crazy, and drawing all these weird uh, com comics. And, uh, Mr. Natural. Yeah, Mr. Natural, <laughs> and this uh, this whole uh, counterculture uh, uh, countercultural comic uh, scene sprang up, and uh, today we have. I was just in a, a an exhibit of uh, uh, alternative, more adult comic artists, and one of the I guess one of the features of them would have been uh, that they were aiming adults at comics, uh, comics at adults more for the first time. Uh, before that, comics had almost always been for kids. I think Matt, the people who did Mad Magazine uh, were really the ones who first started to uh, aim at adults a little bit more, did a lot of parodies and that sort of thing. But uh, 
still weren't really uh, fully aimed at adults. It was more teenagers. And so I guess that would be the distinguishing characteristic. A lot of sex, a lot of nudity, a lot, you know, swearing. Uh, swearing was uh, a big part of the counterculture, you know, the late 60s. Uh, it was all, I always just look at the late 60s as kind of an adolescence trip because uh, most of it was not very sincere. I mean, or, you know, it was sincere in a way, but it wasn't really very radical. It was like more of a rebellion than it was putting forth a positive alternative to the existing system. And uh, I actually think the mid 70s, the early to mid 70s, were a really radical time. You know, when you had the SLA and uh, the, uh, boy, I can't, I haven't been thinking about this, so I can't really just reel them off, but uh, there were so many bombings. I'm not saying this is a good thing, but there were so many hardcore terrorist actions and uh, politically radical actions in the early 70s that we didn't have happening in the 60s. So it's kind of strange the way history, you know, chooses to uh, portray things. But uh, then uh, uh, cartoons, uh, what happened in the uh, late 70s uh, after Oliphant and Jeff McNelly, yeah. who was uh, at that time, I think he was... Uh, he was still working for the Dayton paper, wasn't he? No, he was at the Richmond Times Leader. Uh, he worked at the Richmond Times Leader right out of college in the early 70s, and he won uh, a Pulitzer Prize when he was only 22 years old, which was, uh, I think, is still the record for the youngest person to win a Pulitzer. Um, Jeff McNally had a fantastic, and he's still in the uh, Star and Trib occasionally, fantastic drawing style. One of the most skillful, uh, impressive uh, draftsmen, and not just a draftsman, but a real artist. I mean, if you look at his, I've seen some of his originals, and it's just incredible how obviously effortless it is for him to see the whole thing in his mind and just paint it with, a, with an ink brush. You know, it's just incredible. If you just really can look closely at it, if you can ever see the originals, if they're ever on display, it's really interesting to see the difference between the originals and what you see in the newspaper because you can't see the little paint strokes and everything. But uh, McNelly became hugely popular and uh, very successful. Unfortunately, one of the reasons for this was that McNelly had very bland political viewpoints. He was terrific for commercial media. And in the mid to late 70s, with all these newspapers, which were formerly owned by individuals who cared about what the newspapers uh, stood for and who were willing to kind of take a side. You had newspapers that were called uh, what the Louisville Democrat, you know, or the uh, Richmond T uh, Times Leader Republican, you know, or whatever. Uh, the great tradition of newspapers up until the mid 70s was to, to be very liberal or very conservative, and each newspaper tended to have one very liberal and one very conservative newspaper. Except I think Minneapolis had probably always had two liberal ones. <laughs> uh, but uh, McNelly was very popular because he was so bland. He didn't offend anybody. He didn't really take a stand. But he did these just fantastically well-drawn uh, cartoons. And he also was very funny. He was really funny. So uh, he was very popular. He, within no time, he had 350 newspapers running his cartoons. And during the, uh, the rest of the 70s and into the 80s, through the 80s, the phenomena called the McNelly clones. Everywhere there were young cartoonists or would-be cartoonists, people, young men and mostly men who were very good at drawing, who had very little to say, like McNelly. Uh, but who thought, gee, what a neat way to make um, $150,000 a year, <laughs> you know, to draw five cartoons a week. And uh, so you had this, this huge onslaught of, uh, you know, uh, would-be car political cartoonists who essentially changed the meaning of what an editorial cartoon was, changed the definition of what an editorial cartoon is, and uh, made it something much more bland and much more middle of the road than had ever been the case throughout history. So uh, that was a bad, kind of a bad thing for uh, political cartoons, and, uh, but a good thing for, for publishers of newspapers who wanted a very commercial product that wouldn't offend anyone. And what happened through the 80s is that all of the great newspapers on the left and the right all moved to the middle. And today, we really don't have any great 
large daily newspapers in any city in the entire country that are really strongly conservative or liberal. Well, except the Manchester Union later. And I was thinking of that, actually. Would you say that's one reason, what you just said about McNeely, is that one reason like why Jules Pfeiffer is not widely syndicated? Oh, because sure. Because he has a very part, political point of view? Part of it is a drawing style, too, though. His drawing style is a little unusual. More uh, like a Linda Berry? It's more uh, literary? Uh, well, not so he's pretty well syndicated, actually. In fact, he won a Pulitzer about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. So he's, very, he's pretty mainstream now. He's uh, talking about Jules Pfeiffer of the Village Voice. I'd like to show you some, some slides before we get to all run out of time here. Do you want these on? I think I'm going to leave this light on and see how this goes. But is there a revelation back here? Is there a revelation back here? Paul Revere also did some uh, etchings. Uh, he did an etching of the Boston Massacre that was sort of like a political cartoon. Uh, let's see. These are a couple of pieces by Daumier, a French cartoonist. How is that looking in there? Should that light be out? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Uh, Daumier was uh, a French uh, political cartoonist and painter uh, who did some really brutal, savage political cartoons. I'm not sure the exact time, uh, but I know he preceded Thomas Nast. Here's the, here he's you know got showing some guy putting somebody's head in a vice and I don't I don't read French I'm not sure exactly what it represents but it's uh, quite uh, quite savage by today's standards. Here he is look at this carving up a cat you know it's part of a meal. <laughs> Here's a this is a depiction of the king that landed uh, Daumier in prison for a while. Look at that. Look how awful, you know, the way they're feeding him uh, all their uh, food or whatever. <coughs> Let's see. Make me a little better. Those are some of the earliest political cartoons. Um, and, and they're very expressive, you know, they're not commercial. They're not done to make a buck. They're done to say something about what's going on in the world. Uh, the best political cartoons express a moral outrage. They say, you know, there's something going on wrong here. Uh, Michelangelo was kind of the philosopher of painters. Uh, oh, Diane, you could probably give me a few uh, painters. You know, it's like they, they had different roles, a philosopher or religious uh, uh, spokesman or you know different roles but the political cartoonist was always a moralist someone who is saying that there's a difference between right and wrong and here's here's my argument for what it is or here's my expression of my feeling this was a Pulitzer Prize winner by Ross Lewis who was a cartoonist who I knew uh, who di who did this in 1934 and he died about 10 oh 15 years ago actually um, violence I'll work for both sides strikers and industry. Uh, when I started doing political, or not political cartoons, but when I, f when I first started doing cartoons, I was five years old. My first grade report card said, uh, Peter is a uh, talented little artist who reveals a clever sense of humor in his artwork. <laughs> and uh, that kind of my, was my natural way of expressing myself, an integration of visual and verbal. This is uh, something else I've done, our uh, paintings. Uh, this was a huge mural at, that was at Kinko's in uh, Stadium Village at the university. Uh, took about uh, a year to do it, 60 feet long. Albert Einstein writing on a blackboard over and over, I will not write E equals MC squared. And here's another painting, uh, Groucho. As I said, caricature is one of the most important uh, components of uh, good political cartooning. And I do a lot of caricaturing of entertainers. This is a, this is a very different s approach to uh, caricaturing than what you would use if you were doing a political cartoon because it tends to be much kinder. You know, my feelings toward uh, entertainers are much uh, more favorable or, or 
more benevolent than uh, they are toward uh, politicians. Larry Bud Melman once uh, gave me a piece of toast on a stick, invites me to his birthday party every year. <laughs> Yeah, that's the earlier Arsenio. Who's that? Gene Kelly. Dave Moore. This is a huge uh, uh, caricature I did of Mike Ditka for a Beat the Bears party at the Hyatt a couple years ago. I wear a wig once in a while. Uh, whenever I'm on in the media, uh, on uh, commercial media, I tend to wear a wig because I've gotten some, some uh, rather scary phone calls and letters. They were throwing Nerf balls through his mouth. I first started doing political cartoons uh, <laughs> in Minnesota, uh, 1974. This was for the Minnesota Daily, Richard Nixon, who says crime doesn't pay. Nixon was great, uh, great for caricaturing because he was so ugly. This is the fir first cartoon I got published in Time Magazine. Nowadays, it's more art, it's more illustrators. Uh, it used to be more people who could think. <laughs> now it's more people who can draw. And actually, you know what it is more now? It's cleverness. It's uh, uh, the ability to do cartoons that are kind of like stand-up uh, comic material, which is really sad. Because it's, you know, it's a whole different uh, art form. Some of them are good, though. Some of them are pretty good. One thing about satire that's difficult to do in the 90s is uh, uh, any satire that uh, deals effectively <coughs> with uh, racism or sexism, uh, I've always found that in order to make it really work, you have to be ready to use the symbols and the words and the, uh, the uh, language of the racists and the sexists themselves in order to show how stupid they are. And, uh, uh, you know, this kind of a cartoon would never have gotten past my current editor, yet it was one of the most effective cartoons. I th it was a fantastic statement on the way he used Michael Jackson, you know, by pulling him out of the front lawn of the White House right before the uh, 84 elections. Waldheimer said he didn't remember being a Nazi. This is one of the more popular cartoons that I've ever done. after uh, everybody expected Fritz to win big <laughs> in all the primaries and he lost a few of them and then he went around you know kissing up to all the labor unions and all the special interest groups and they started uh, started getting somewhere yeah. Mike Mike should she's already doing this if you want to go kind of go over the room there. Oh, the no okay 
Uh, remember the famous, uh, the famous uh, debate with Mondale, Reagan and Mondale, where he uh, tells Mondale he's not going to make age an issue. He's not going to let Mondale's youth or inexperience <laughs> be held against him. Uh, here's the uh, after comment afterwards. No, most uh, political cartoonists, <laughs> uh, the deciding factor is uh, getting a job at a daily, and then they become syndicated. You almost never hear of anyone getting syndicated first. This was an award winner. Here's after uh, Governor Perpich lost. Going back to Disneyland. <laughs> oh boy, what is this? Remember uh, Bush's outburst at Dan Rather? This was a popular full page piece, Dan Quayle, boy president. I grudgingly supported Dukakis just because I didn't think the environment could take another four years of a Republican administration right away. <laughs> the best cartoons should be uh, very opinionated, but they should be good enough to, so that people who disagree with you still find the cartoon to be interesting to read or fun to look at. And <coughs> even if they disagree with your point of view, uh, they can find it you know, to be a good cartoon. That's getting harder and harder in the 90s. It's just the, the level of intolerance and uh, you know, special interest uh, focus and self-interest obsession has really made it hard. I, it's, it's interesting if you, I saw an old rerun of an old uh, Phil Donahue show from like the late 70s. It was real interesting how they had these far out radical or right wing guests on but the audience sat very politely and quietly and listened to both sides and they afterwards they stood up and they expressed their differences of opinion in an intelligent rational way today the tendency you know on the talk shows is ooh yay you know it's like it's a it's a kind of an, it's all an emotional gut reaction they're not using their brains ever and if you disagree with the person kill them <laughs> You know, so doing political cartoons in the 90s is a lot less fun in that regard than it was doing them in the 70s. Now, I've had some fans in high places. Uh, Governor Perpich requested, I think, about seven of my originals uh, that I had drawn about him, which is kind of, I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not, you know? <laughs> and uh, these types of letters, uh, from people like Tony Boza. Uh, again, I, I, you know, I sort of wonder if I'm slipping when I start getting these kind of compliments from uh, uh, people and public officials. <laughs> here's, a, here's a Bill Sanders cartoon, uh, one of the new wave cartoonists. This is during the Watergate hearings. I don't care if high government officials corrupted the courts, FBI, CIA, Justice Department, and the democratic process. I want to see I Love Lucy. And look at that drawing style. The guy was funny, you know? I mean, his drawings are, 
are funny. They're vicious. They're expressive. Uh, they're uh, they just really get the point across, and they don't they, they don't worry about being so cute or so clever. They make a, a more direct statement. Remember now, you're under strict orders not to hit any dikes, hospitals, schools, or other civilian targets. <laughs> this is during the Vietnam or Vet or Cambodian uh, bombings. Gee, I wonder if I could qualify for some of those government fringe benefits. Look at the license plate. <laughs> Spiro Agnew, retired crook. <laughs> Look at those characters, you know. I mean, the guy is just, just great. This is one of mine from City Pages. <laughs> I think, I think he, this was during the bombings, you know, all the bombings of the abortion clinics. And uh, uh, again, whether you agree with uh, the point of view or not, uh, if you can pick out a, an obvious hypocrisy, uh, people should be able to agree on that. And it's very scary that so many people try to rationalize to uh, justify things like that, that is kind of violence. Uh, it's not, not the America I grew up in, that's for sure. <laughs> Curly hair. And I didn't really leave enough room, but these tremendous jowls. <laughs> and the old Nixon, before he uh, got, got a new makeup man, had this 5 o'clock shadow. Little, little trademark. <laughs> so, you know, a caricature can be like that. Um, let's see. Who did we have after Nixon? Ford, right? Uh, Jerry Ford was difficult for most cartoonists because they felt that he was uh, too plain and uh, didn't have anything. I don't think that was true, but I, I countered that argument by saying, okay, if that's what you think, then just do a caricature of Ford like this. <laughs> and then that would not only show you all of his outstanding physical characteristics, <laughs> but it would give you some insight into his personality as well. Actually, I thought Ford was quite easy to do. He had some really strange characteristics. Kind of these Frankenstein eyes and head. Bozo the president hair. <laughs> High bony cheekbones, long upper lip, kind of a simian look. <laughs> it's kind of football chin. So Ford was really not that difficult to do. I didn't think he was anyway. Then of course we had uh, a Democrat for a little while. And when he was first elected, he was best known for this. Yeah. A big gummy smile. That would be Jimmy Carter. And the interesting thing about the Carter family was that they all looked alike. <laughs> Remember the Carters, Jimmy, you know? Uh, say if you took this same caricature of Jimmy, made it a little fatter, a little wrinklier, and put a sweatshirt on instead of a suit and tie, and a can of beer in the hand, and you had Miss Lillian. <laughs> <laughs> or many years later, going to college. Yeah. Amy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after Carter, oh boy, I loved Reagan. He was a cartoonist <laughs> dream come true. And Reagan, when uh, cartoonists first started doing him, was hard to do because he had so many wrinkles. 
and they would try to draw all these millions of wrinkles. And when they reduced the drawing down to publish it in the newspaper, uh, you just, with all these wrinkles, just kind of coagulate into a little black dot where his face was supposed to be. But he had these waddles, you know, kind of like a turkey under his chin. And uh, for Reagan, it was that, that hair, fantastic hair, and big ears. And years later, and uh, how big are yours? Uh, about 12 inches wide by eight and a half high. And let's just do one last one. I haven't really gotten into the Democratic candidates. I guess I won't need to, huh? <laughs> George Bush, it's interesting, his nose doesn't really look like that, but somehow that looks right in a caricature. Do you study photographs or just kind of experiment? Yes. <coughs> Which is pretty good for caricaturing. So uh, doing a, so you sort of express something in, in the caricature, and uh, finally, this wasn't part of the presentation. <laughs> Caricaturing at parties. Okay. <laughs> so, I don't know. What do you think? That's what it is. It is. Thanks for coming. Any other questions for Pete before we take a little break? <laughs> Why don't we take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and. Uh, okay, thanks everybody. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you.